please open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. When you work hard, it's easier to do that work when you know that there is some kind of rest and relief or reward waiting for you. The best example, perhaps, is the woman who endures labor, knowing that seeing her baby is at the end of it. And the man who plows his field and sows the seed does so in expectation of the harvest and enjoying all of that crop when the time comes. And so hard work is is easier to do and easier to endure when we know there is rest, relief, and a reward that awaits us. When I was younger, my dad being a seminary professor, a lot of uh, seminary students and their wives or families would move into town. And me and my brothers, being young men, what was our duty? Help them move. (laughs) So we moved many a student into apartments and many a student out of apartments when they finished. And it was always an interesting experience going from the truck to the apartment, up the stairs, down the stairs, etc., passing by the pool, the apartment pool. And every box you carry and every drop of sweat that you drop is done so in hopes that at the conclusion of all of that lifting and all of that placing and putting, will be some swimming in the pool and some pizza. The prospect of pizza and pools was enough to help us to endure the work of moving seminary students in and out uh, all the time. And it was, other times we had to move them across town. They weren't even moving into town, just moving across town. In fact, one time my brothers and I were in the back of the U-Haul in the dark, shut up, holding things carefully as we went across town. But I didn't tell you that. Uh, We weren't on the freeway, we were just on the streets. And it was actually the speed bumps that were the worst part uh, back there. It was fun, anyway. We did so in hopes of pizza and pools. Rest, relief, and a reward made the work easier along the way and worth it in the end. Well, we've been studying in 1 Peter the commands that God has given us. He has said, humble yourselves under my mighty hand that mighty hand that sends or permits afflictions and difficulties in our lives. And we've been told to resist the attacks attacks of the subtle hand of Satan. We need to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand and resist the cunning hand of Satan every day, all of our lives. And in verse 10 of chapter 5, we are given a refreshing promise from God himself of what he himself will do at the end of our afflictions and at the conclusion of our temptations. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 5 and just verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. As a preacher, when you study the text in preparation for your sermon, one of the most basic things that you do is pay attention to, you've heard this from me before, the indicatives and the imperatives. The indicatives are the things that are declared or stated In that text, and the imperatives are the commands. What are the things that God would have us to know? What are the things that God would have us to do? The indicatives and the imperatives. And that's important so that we teach each one according to what it is. The indicatives we declare and we tell and we teach. This is what you need to know. And the imperatives we teach as imperatives. This is what you must do. This is how you must live. And we should not confuse those two. As we look at our text, 1 Peter 5.10 this morning, notice that it contains no commands. It simply contains blessed statements, blessed declarations. In fact, these are promises of God. These are commitments from God to us. He is engaging himself in the fullness of his perfection and power to do these things on our behalf. 
But I want you to take a look at your bulletin and the quote of the week because the ESV rearranges the order of this verse compared to how Peter originally expressed it. And the, the meaning comes out the same, but there's a certain emphasis that I believe is lost in the way that uh, it is printed in the English Standard Version. In the Greek text, as, as Peter had it written down, it does not begin with, and after you have suffered a little while. The, the, the primary placement, the, the frontal placement of this statement is the beginning of the God of all grace. That is what is first, that is what is primary, and that is what is principal in what Peter is saying. It goes like this, then the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, he, there's an emphasis in the Greek on he himself, he will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So this text is not about what we should do. That's been the, the, the preceding teaching. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Resist Satan. But now here we have beautiful, sweet promises from God to encourage us and give us hope based on what he himself will do. Let's consider four points as we study this text. Number one, the God of all grace. The God of all grace. This is how Peter begins this verse. The God of all grace. And this is a title that appears nowhere else in scripture. Did Peter coin this phrase? Was it unique to him? I, I don't know, but we don't read it anywhere else in the written word of God. Why would Peter say this, the God of all grace? Well, ask yourself this question. Did Peter know the grace of God? When you think of an apostle who's a, a champion of God's grace, we probably think of Paul first, who says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am the chief or the foremost. And God had mercy on me. We think of Paul's conversion and God's grace and mercy to him and how Paul loves to magnify the grace of God. But was Peter any less experienced in the grace of God? No, in fact, we could make a reasonable argument that Peter knew or had an experience of the grace of God that was superior to Paul's. Why? Because Paul persecuted the church and did all that he did in ignorance. He thought, he truly thought he was serving the God of Israel. His zeal was a zeal for God, wrongly placed, wrongly understood. But he thought, I am serving the God of Israel by suppressing this sect. But Peter lived with Jesus. And Peter ate with Jesus. And Peter listened to Jesus for years. Jesus called Peter to follow him personally. Peter made the confession that Jesus is the Son of God. Peter witnessed the miracles of Jesus. Peter ate the bread that Jesus divided. Peter ate the fish that Jesus multiplied. Peter took the coins out of the fish's mouth to pay the taxes at Jesus' command. Peter walked on water to Jesus. Peter saw the transfiguration of Jesus when Moses and Elijah appeared and he saw the glory cloud and he heard the voice of God coming from it, commanding that they hear Jesus. Peter ate the last supper with Jesus as we have been reading in Luke chapter 22. Peter declared that he would never abandon the Lord, but he would go with him even to death. And then when Jesus was in his deepest distress, and surrounded by his enemies, Peter denied Jesus. But Peter did not just deny him in ignorance, nor did he deny him only once, nor did he deny him thinking that he was serving God. Peter knew all of these things, and knowing these things, he abandoned the Son of God. He denied Jesus, whom he knew was the Son of God. He denied God in the flesh, and then he denied him a second time. And then he swore with curses that he did not know Jesus, whom he had confessed is the Son of God. And 
what did we read even today in Luke 22? But when you have turned, when you have turned, comfort your brethren. Jesus forgave him. Jesus forgave Peter's betrayal. He forgave Peter's denial. He forgave Peter's sin. And he restored him. So when Peter calls God the God of all grace, he is speaking from deep personal experience. The scriptures in many places speak of God's grace or call God gracious. But Peter says God is the God of all all grace. He goes for the superlative. God is the God of all grace, and he had every reason to say this, and he was so right. And every Christian should be able to take this title, the God of all grace, and shout it loudly. God is the God of all grace. Why? Because each one of us says, he saved me freely. Freely. That's grace. Grace is giving freely. And our salvation is by grace. We were blind. We were wretches. We were lost. And he found us. He saved us. He made us to see. He saved me so freely. My salvation is by grace alone from the God of all grace. Now, grace is giving freely. But grace to sinners is just mind-boggling freedom, mind-boggling goodness and mercy. Grace to sinners is, is an altogether different classification of grace because you're giving to those who not only are undeserving, but those who deserve the contrary, those who ought to be condemned and therefore punished for their sins, God's creatures, his angels and, and men, but thinking particularly of men, they're disobedient, they're corrupt, they're wicked. They're dead in their sins and trespasses. They hate God. They abhor him. They do not do what he has commanded. They do what he has forbidden. They pervert his truth. They distort it. They worship the creature instead of the creator. And on and on and on. There is none good. No, not one. And it is these wicked ones upon whom God has mercy and compassion and says, I will save them. I will graciously save them from their sins. I will graciously rescue them from their condemnation. I will graciously bring them out and awaken them and give them life out of death. And so we who have been saved from that death and that condemnation and that castigation, that punishment, we say God is the God of all grace. Who of us can say, I stand in God's favor by my own righteousness. It is, it is foolishness. Uh, the moment the words leave your lips, you regret having said them. <laughs> Why are my sins forgiven? Is it because I have suffered some punishment by which my sins are wiped away? Is it because I have paid the debt that I ought to pay? No. It is because Jesus gave himself. It is because God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, gave himself to suffer in my place and to die in my place and to pay my debt that I might receive that, abs that absolution, that forgiveness, that remission freely. I did nothing to earn it. I did nothing to obtain it of my own righteousness or my own works. And now I have eternal life. Now I will live forever. Now I will never be banished to darkness and torment and flame, but rather I have an eternal life that awaits me. Why do I have that? Why am I a possessor and an heir of eternal life? I may not yet experience it in fullness, but I have a right and title to it. I have a claim to it. Is it because of my obedience? Is it because of my righteousness? I don't have any righteousness. If I did produce any righteousness, I would have to say, like Paul, it's filthy rags worthy of nothing other than to be burned, thrown away and burned. But brothers and sisters, to understand why God is the God of all grace, we need to think in terms greater than our salvation. Because as I've said in other sermons and want to continue to emphasize to you, salvation's not the end. It's a means to an end. It's ultimately not the gift. Salvation is a gift, but it's not the gift. 
Everyone knows that at Christmas, the stockings are first and then the real gifts. So there are lesser gifts that precede the greater gifts. Salvation is a lesser gift. Well, what's greater than the forgiveness of my sins, the imputation of Christ's righteousness, the adoption of God, progressive sanctification, I having been born again preceding these things, and preservation, what, what gift is greater? The giver. Remember that God gives himself to us, and salvation is not the end, but the means to the end. What is the end? Communion with God. If God is the source of, and the sum of all goodness, and he gives himself to us, then he gives us the greatest good to we who are most unworthy. And therefore he is the God of all grace because there's nothing greater he could give us other than himself. And he has given us himself in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he has given himself to us freely. He has given himself to us graciously. He has given himself to us when we deserved to be banished from his presence, from his light, from his favor, from his mercy, from his goodness, from his blessedness. And yet he says, come to me, be with me, know me, participate in my goodness, be overflowing with my goodness. I bless you, brothers and sisters. That is tr most truly and ultimately why he is the God of all grace, not just because we are saved by grace, but because we are saved by grace that we might receive God by, by grace. We have nothing but what we have received. And in Christ, we have received pardon, peace, endless life, and communion with God, the God of all grace. But I have to ask you, do you know the God of all grace? Children, do you know the God of all grace? God will forgive all your sins and he will give you that eternal life of which we have been speaking and he will bring you into an endless communion with himself and enjoyment of himself. He will give it to you freely by grace. How do we receive the free gift of God? It is with the empty and open hands, the empty, open and outstretched hands that are faith. It is by faith alone that we receive the gracious gift of God and our faith rests in and receives what? Jesus Christ. We believe on and we call upon the name of Jesus Christ and in him we receive this salvation. In him we receive the forgiveness of our sins. In him we receive his righteousness, his obedience, which is credited or imputed to us because we are united to him. In him we receive everything. And so by faith we confess he is Lord. And by faith we believe God raised him from the dead. Which by saying that God raised him from the dead, we acknowledge various things. He is a man. He is God in the flesh. He lived innocently. He lived obediently. He died on the cross. He gave himself as a sacrifice, as a substitute for sinners. He suffered in our place. And he rose from the dead. And he ascended into heaven. And he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Will you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? What promise do the scriptures attach to those empty hands outstretched by faith? They say, and you will be saved. And thus saved, what do we do? We dedicate ourselves entirely to obey him. We serve him. We live for him. We freely and openly declare we are his slaves. We give everything that we are and everything that we have to him and anything he commands us, we will do it gladly. Why? Because he loved me. Because he is the God of all grace who has saved me from all of my sin and misery and given me the sum and source of all good, God himself. And he has done so freely. If he has loved me so freely and given to me so freely, why would I withhold my hand from serving him? Why would I call his commands a burden? Why would I say, I know he has called me to do such and such a thing, but I will withhold my service and my obedience from him. I withhold myself from serving him. 
No, the Christian who has been forgiven much, loves much, and serves much, and obeys much, and offers themselves as a living sacrifice, entirely dedicated and consecrated unto God. But we have to ask the question, if God gives so freely, if he reparts this gift of salvation and himself ultimately so freely to those who believe in Christ Jesus, whose only necessary response is the outstretched hands of faith, if that is the case, why is it that more do not come? And the answer is that they do not want it, which is to say they do not believe the offer. They do not believe the declaration. They do not believe the promise. If they believed, they would come. If someone says dinner is served and you don't come to the table, it would be because you don't believe dinner is served. There's no food on that table. And so those who do not confess Jesus as Lord and who do not believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead need to understand that you're not in a neutral position. You're not in a let's find out, let's wait and see position. You're dead in your sins, condemned because of your sins and awaiting with a fearful expectation the judgment of God. What must I do to be saved then? Come to Christ. And the God of all grace will forgive your sins. And he will give you eternal life. And he will give himself to you, which is the greatest gift of all. God is the God of all grace. And all his grace is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Bow to Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. He is the God of all grace. Secondly, his eternal glory. You probably know the expression, you've made your bed, now sleep in it. It's a phrase we use to express that we have to live with the choices that we've made. Sometimes we have to live with the consequences, or sometimes it's just the results. This is what you did, or this is what you chose. You have to live with the results of your own work. Have you ever worked to make a meal, even if it's just a sandwich, and at the end you say, what is this? This is not even good. I made this and I worked on this. It's not even good. Now I have to eat it. Did you ever make a craft in Sunday school and you just look at the work of your own hands and you're ashamed? Oh, I'm telling on myself. What would it be like if after humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God and resisting Satan, faithful unto death, what, wait, what awaited us after that was simply the result of our own efforts? You get whatever you accumulated. You get what you got in this life. What if the only glory waiting for you was your glory? Well, let each one of us rejoice in these words. The God of all grace has called us to his eternal glory. The things that we make don't last. The glory of our deeds fades from memory, and the things we do are forgotten. The things we produce decay, and if you amass wealth for retirement, it can be gone faster than you think. If you build a house to live in for the rest of your life, that house may become the very source of stress and distress and misery for you instead of a relief that you hoped it would be. If you make an amazing Thanksgiving dinner, it produces a wonderful meal and it produces wonderful leftovers. But after a few days, no matter how much you enjoy those foods, they begin to go bad. Even the best meal begins to go bad. They don't last. The things we make, the things we do, they don't last. But what a comfort to know the God of all grace has called us to his eternal glory. And notice it's his eternal glory. When we read this, it should instantly say, wait a minute, Peter's concluding as he began. Let's turn back to chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. 
The God of all grace has called us to his eternal glory. Are we supposed to know, Peter, what his eternal glory is? Yes, I told you in chapter 1, says Peter. Look at verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, this God of all grace. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now here is his eternal glory. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The glory that awaits us, the inheritance ahead of us, is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's an eternal glory. In Christ Jesus, God has given us an eternal glory that awaits us, and we wait for it. And that glory that awaits us, that inheritance at the end, is not the work of our hands. It's not the glory that we have gained but rather it is the glory of God won for us by Jesus Christ and kept for us, kept for you. And Peter says we've been called to this eternal glory, which reminds us of 1 Peter 1.1, where we are elect exiles, a chosen people. Or chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You've been called to this eternal glory. God has said, you and you and you and you, come to my eternal glory. And we have said, thank you, Lord, I receive it in Jesus Christ. So we who enter the eternal glory, it's not because we've stormed the gates of heaven and demanded entrance, let me in. But rather it's because God opened the doors and called us to come in. And we called on the name of the Lord for mercy because he called for us. He said, come to my son. And we said, we come, Lord, we come. And brothers and sisters, if we have been called to his eternal glory, then we ought to do what Peter commanded in 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says, the best is yet to come, and it is coming for you. So set your hope fully on that. And again, as he concludes his lesson, his his epistle, Peter says, the God of all grace has called you to his eternal glory. It is awaiting us, and we are waiting for it. And if you wait with patience, what is that? Paul calls that hope in Romans. Thirdly, a little while. A little while. Once again, Peter concludes as he began. I've said in the early sermons on this book that this is an epistle for the in-between. We are born again unto a living hope, but we're waiting for that greater glory. So it's started, but it's not finished. We're in-between. And we just read about the eternal glory that awaits us in chapter 1. It's just mentioned in our verse in in verse 10, but back to chapter 1, it's explained in more fullness. But what follows after those verses in chapter 1, after describing his eternal glory to which we have been called and unto which we have been born again, what about the in-between? Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1. In this you rejoice, in the eternal glory to which he has called you and unto which you have been born again, you rejoice. Though now... For a little while, you have been grieved by various trials. And so as we come to chapter 5 and verse 10, what does he say? The God of all grace has called you to his, his eternal glory in Christ, but you're not there yet, after you have suffered a little while. We suffer various trials in the in-between for a little while. For a little while, we endure we, we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And for a little while, we resist the, the attacks of Satan, our adversary. But how long is a little while? How long is a little while? Peter says, a little while. And we say, Peter, could you, could you be a little more specific? <laughs> how long 
is a little while. It's, it's a relative concept. A little while is relative. I've mentioned this before, but when, my, when I was a child and my mom would take me to Joanne's Fabrics, I would ask, how long are we going to be here? And if she said, a little while, that was not much comfort. Because a little while for my mom and Joanne's Fabrics is not a little while to little me. For her, it seemed like no time at all. For me, it was endless. When I go on a trip to another country, spending two weeks in another part of the world seems both short and long at the same time. At the beginning, it seems so long. At the end, it seems so short. So 30 minutes in Joanne's can seem so long or so short. Two weeks in another country can seem so long and so short. It's relative, a little while. So if the concept of a little while is relative, to what is the phrase a little while relative in the text? Is there something we can relate a little while to that will give us a better understanding of why it's just a little while, when for us it may seem like such a long while? Well, that to which a little while is relative in the text is God's eternal glory. Eternity is the relative term in comparison with a little while. The little while which we experience in the flesh and in the Lord, in the flesh and in the Lord, in this body but born again, is at its maximum nine or ten decades. At the most, if, if someone came to the Lord very, very young and lived a very, very full life, nine or ten decades in the flesh and in the Lord, but for most of us, more like five decades in the flesh and in the Lord, that's a little while. That's a little while. And we have to remember that we are pilgrims in the wilderness waiting for our inheritance, waiting to enter into it. That we are in exile waiting to return to what is rightfully ours. And Israel was in the desert 40 years and in, in exile for 70 years. And we too must spend a little while waiting, wandering, can we submit to the mighty hand of God and resist Satan for that little while? Can we submit to the hand of God, humble ourselves be beneath it, and resist Satan for 70 years? We can. Of course we can. Yes, we can. Because the God of all grace has called us to an eternal glory. And the eternity to which he calls you is is better in multiple ways. It's not just better than a little while because it's interminable or endless. It's not just he's called you to an endless timeline, which is better than your, your short and finite timeline. It's not just better in quantity, it's better in quality. That eternal glory will be an altogether different way of experiencing time. It will be an altogether different way of experiencing existence. Because we are accustomed to time as that which is things in motion and things being pulled down. Time for us is decay. Time for us is dissolution. Time for us is seeing things uh, move in the natural world that God has made. That's how we measure time, by motion. But in eternity, the eternity to which God calls us, it, there will not be that same perception of, oh, it's been so long. For us, with decay and with deterioration and dissolution and motion, for us, we say, it's been so long. But you won't have that kind of experience. Yes, time is passing, but you won't have the same experience of the passing of time. And so the eternal glory to which you are called is not just better because it's endless. It's better because it's different. <laughs> it's not this and then that and then this and then that in, in terms of a, wow, that was so long, but it's a a never-endingness that blesses us. And relative to that interminable but also different eternity, is 70 years a little while? It is a little while. Relatively speaking, a 70-year-old will tell you that it wasn't a little while 
in the sense that they've seen many things and done many things in 70 years. 70 years is not a little while relative to the passage of time within this world. You look at the, you look at the world as it was when you were a 10-year-old and now you're 70 or 80 and you say, that world doesn't exist anymore. The world I grew up in doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's gone. And the children who are 10 now in 70 years, they will say the same thing. So 70 years does, is a long time relative to human existence and, and progress and decay. And so we often say, 70 years, that's so long. 80 years, that's so long. But it's relative. When we make it relative to his eternal glory to which he has called us, we say, it is a little while. It is a breath, a vapor, a shadow. Life runs faster than the weaver's shuttle, the scriptures say. And so we need to submit to God's mighty hand for a little while and resist Satan for a little while. And then what? Fourthly and lastly, the king who heals. As I said before, the ESV somewhat rearranges the order of Peter's words with the same sense overall, but a slight loss of emphasis, we might say. Because the way that Peter has it, which is in your bulletin, is then the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory after you have suffered a little while. Since he has already said the God of all grace, he has to bring God back into the sentence. And so he says, he, in an emphatic way, he himself, he will restore you. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you. He will establish you. When my brothers and I helped those students move into the apartments, pizza and pools were our reward. And rest and relief at the end of it all made it easier and worth it. Pizza and pools may be a sufficient refreshment for one day of manual labor, but what about a lifetime? What about a lifetime of humbling ourselves and resisting? What about a return from war? Is a pizza party, a pizza and pool party, a sufficient way to refresh a soldier? No. So what awaits us when Christ's soldiers come off of the battlefield? God calls them to his eternal glory. But he doesn't send them away to be rested and refreshed somewhere else by someone else. The text says that what awaits the soldiers of, of Christ at the end of his battle and at the conclusion of their race is this, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory after you have suffered a little while, he will restore. He will confirm. He will strengthen. He will establish you. And Peter chains these four words together, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish. The king that sent you into battle, he knows your name. He knows you. And when you are brought off of the battlefield, he himself will restore you and confirm you and strengthen you and establish you because the mighty hand that lays us low, what did Peter say already? At the right time, he will exalt you. And the mighty hand of the king to which we have submitted is also a healing hand. How does the king himself heal us? There's a, a healing progression in these four words. First, we're restored. When something is broken, it needs to be put back together. And the first word that Peter uses is one of bringing back to completion. It could be translated, he will perfect you. You will be made whole. What was broken is restored to working order. There's nothing wrong with this thing. It's restored. It was broken. It was hurt. It was harmed. It was wounded. But now it's been cured. Now it's been healed. Now it's been put back together. It is as it should be. There's nothing wrong with it. God heals and restores all wounds and broken bones being made right and made well. He restores us first. The soldier is healed. Second, we are confirmed. And this is a word that means to, to set something up. 
So first, God heals you, and then he stands you up because you are made whole again. He confirms us. And then he strengthens us. After someone is healed, then they go through rehabilitation. They stand up again and they begin to recover their strength. They need to be rehabilitated. And that's normally a slow and difficult process because it depends entirely on the will of the person to give their effort to rehabilitate themselves. No one can walk for you. No one can stand for you. No one can lift a weight or do it, perform an action for you. No one can rehabilitate you. You have to do it. You have to commit and resolve and dedicate yourself to rehabilitation. Others can show you the way, but you must walk it. And so some people, some people are not rehabilitated because they are unwilling. But we're told here, the king himself will strengthen you. This will not be the king leading you through a process of rehabilita rehabilitation that depends on the output, depends on the input. You are as rehabilitated as you rehabilitate yourself. No, he himself will strengthen you. He has healed you. He has stood you up. He makes you strong. And fourthly, we are established. The word here is for foundations. If you stand a piece of lumber up, it may be a complete whole piece of wood. It may be a strong piece of wood, but you can knock it over. It's standing, but it may fall. But God will not just stand us up. He will establish us such that we may never and will never fall again. Nothing will break what God has restored. Nothing will lay low what God has raised up. Nothing will weaken what God has strengthened. And nothing will tear down what God has established. Why? Because the God of all grace has done it. He himself will do this. How will he do this? First, God restores and confirms and strengthens and establishes the soul. The soul of the soldier when they die. Because to die in faith is their victory. They leave the battlefield victorious and God restores them in the soul, glorifying and perfecting the soul of the Christian, which is the first exaltation and lifting up of the Christian. And then... When Jesus returns, God will restore and confirm and strengthen and establish the body of the soldier. And this is their final victory and their final lifting up and their final exaltation, such that the soul will begin to enjoy the eternal glory of God at death. He has called us to his eternal glory, and we will begin to enjoy it as souls when we die. But the whole man, body and soul, will enjoy the eternal glory of God when Christ makes us entirely whole. There are degrees of glory, degrees, degrees of perfection. The soul is perfected, then the body is perfected and reunited such that the glory that awaits us is beyond all glories. Brothers and sisters, I said at the beginning that you preach indicatives as indicatives, statements and declarations as statements, and imperatives as imperatives, commands as commands. Here we have a text full of precious promises, indicatives. Is, is there a duty? Is there a response? Is there an application for those who receive these promises? And the answer is yes. When we are given indicatives, the duty is to believe them. The duty is to believe them. If God promises you something, you put your hand out and you receive it. Believe these promises. But I already believed Grow in your belief and enjoy your belief and strengthen your belief. It's not become convinced of it anew. It's grow in your delight of these things. Know it more fully. Expect it more fully. Hope for it more fully. Set your hope fully. Enjoy it. Delight in it. Rejoice in it. And you can do that without holding back because the Lord of hosts will do this. You have but to watch. You have but to be silent, as the Lord said to his people when they were backed against the Red Sea or when the Assyrian armies threatened to devour them. You have but to watch. You have but to be silent. I will do this. The God of all grace, he himself will accomplish it. And our response, our duty, is to believe and to enjoy these promises. 
For a little while, we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. And for a little while, we resist Satan's cunning hand. And all the while, we believe and we hope. Because the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory, after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Praise God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these precious promises that we receive and enjoy in Christ Jesus freely. We praise you that you are the God of all grace. We praise you that you have called us to your eternal glory. We praise you that you have made our suffering a little while. And we praise you that you yourself will restore and confirm and strengthen and establish us. Help us to be good soldiers. Help us to humble ourselves under your mighty hand and to resist Satan at every turn. Give us patience and perseverance as we wait for that day when you will act, when you will bring us home, when you will restore us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.